This word comes to us from the Gospel according to St. John. It's a continuation of this farewell conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples. Last week's words were those familiar words, don't let your heart be troubled, don't let them be afraid. Uh, Moving toward the end of that part that we shared last week of this same um, conversation that he's having Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. And then he says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And now, here are the next words. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Those who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the dew and refresh. Come as the fire and burn. Convict, convert, and consecrate many hearts and lives to our great good and to thy greater glory. And all this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. I don't know if you like to be alone or not. Some of us are wired to be such that we have to be in the presence of other people. It feeds us. We get energy from it. Others of us are very content to have intentional time completely alone. In fact, the, the aloner it can be, the better. I don't know how or why it is the case that we are made that way. We reduce those, uh, those traits to categories, extroverts, introverts. How many extroverts do we have in the room? Raise a hand. Barker, please. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to ask how many introverts there are in the room because we don't like to raise our hands either. (laughs) There's a sense in which being alone is the stuff that feeds us. And yet, to be alone ultimately is among the greatest fears one could ever have, it would seem, right? Uh, I... I am an introvert, and I need alone time. Uh, I relish it. And there comes a time when I can't deal with just me anymore. I need the interaction of someone else, of family, of friends. I need the, the, the energy that comes with being with other people until it's time to go be alone again. But I have that, in that sense of me recognizing that ultimately, while I prefer to be alone, I'm never really ever alone. Because you have to have people who love you enough to leave you alone, and in that, there is a relational participation of what it means. Uh, It's never occurred to me in all my life that I will be absolutely, completely, and forever alone. Now, I share that as preface for what's happening in the gospel in this reading. As we know, this is a part of an extended, uh, several chapters worth 
of conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples before he was going to go off and do what it was he was to do. We call it his farewell discourse, his final words, his valedictory address, if you will, right? Those final words spoken on a big occasion that sets the tone for all that has been, but especially cast the light forward to what will be the great unknown. And Jesus, in company with his disciples with whom he has lived, ministered, healed, taught, they are now frantic by the thought of him talking about, I'm not going to be here much longer, and where I'm going, you cannot come. Now wait a minute, Jesus, where are you going? How can we know the way? The answer, I am the way. That was last week, right? I'm the way. The way to live, the way to be. And into this conversation comes these words. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will not leave you orphaned. And in the worst possible sense, right, you think about being orphaned is uh, an embodiment of being alone. Let me take each in turn. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It sounds like Jesus is setting up another if-then, right? Uh, one of these conditionals. If you love me, then you keep my commandments. If you're not keeping my commandments, therefore you must not love me. Now that's very Western thinking. It, it, for we who like empirical understandings and logic, that must be what that means, right? No, that is not what that means. It, you could make the case for it, but what, what Jesus is really trying to tell us here is not if you love me, then you will keep my commandments it, in, in a conditional way. Rather, if you love me, the byproduct of that will be you will keep my commandments. And two in particular, you will love me with all you have and are, and you will love what I love. Now, notice, we're not talking a whole list of doctrinal statements that give evidence to whether or not you love God. No doctrinal statements about how the church should be or what the church should do or what the church shouldn't do or how the world must be. The commandments that are the living expression of love of God are simply these. You live out your love of God by loving your neighbor, period. That's it. Seems simple, right? Well, in theory, but how great are we at it? That gets kind of is the point. Um, there are moments we may have flashes of God's love that become clear. And then there's this other thing. I'm not going to leave you orphaned. I'm not leaving you alone, even though I am going away. I will give you, I will ask God, and you will be given an advocate another presence. Now, the church has worked on this for millennia and figured out this must be the Holy Spirit to which Acts 2 points. And if, because we always have to figure out why certain things mean certain things, if that's where we want to go, we can. That's fine. But to say, if I'm not with you physically anymore, I'm still very much with you, living out the love of God with you, now we're getting to the heart of the matter. Now we're getting to it. We're getting to the place where we live, right? Because we don't have the benefit of being first account witnesses to all the things that we read in Scripture. And true enough, there are times we read these stories, these episodes of Jesus' life, and we who count ourselves disciples and have said yes to Jesus and love Jesus deeply, don't you at some point wonder what must have been like to have been there in that moment, to have, to have heard his voice, to have watched him minister, and how would we have reacted, and would it have been appreciably different from what the disciples then did? We live in the space that he's telling them, Jesus is telling the disciples they're about to live into, absent my physical presence, I am still 
ever-present with you. And this advocate, this spirit that comes, is meaningful for us. Several years ago, Barbara Lundblad uh, preached here a long time ago. Great, I might killer preacher. Killer here means amazing, just so we understand what we're all saying here. But in her sermon on this text, I just want to share a little paragraph because I think this points toward why we need to understand not only are we not alone in this moment, but why we need the presence of an advocate, a spirit, a guide in this time and place. She says, love and the spirit, these two are at the center of Jesus' farewell message, his last lecture series, she calls it. Love one another as I have loved you, and the spirit of truth will abide with you when I'm gone. A little later in the same chapter, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit, whom God will send in my name, will teach you everything and will remind you of all that I have said to you. That is, Jesus was saying, you don't know everything yet. You have more to learn. Now let that set for a second. Why do we need the Spirit to guide us going forward? Because we don't know everything yet. We have more to learn. In every generation, you will be faced with new questions and perplexities. Does the sun revolve around the earth, or is it the other way around? Historically, we know, well, that became a pretty big deal for the church. Should nuclear weapons ever be used against an enemy? What does the Spirit tell us about that? Should women who feel called by God be ordained to preach? Has the church ever had to wrestle with that one? She says at the last, Jesus knew there would be some questions the sacred writings did not address. Jesus acknowledged that there would be some things he never talked about. The Spirit will be your tutor, he said, guiding you into all truth. Why do we need the Spirit of God, the living Spirit of God, to guide us in this moment? Because that is the living expression of God that binds us in community, assures us that we are not alone, and is the medium through which we discern how do we handle the questions of our day? How do we handle the questions of our time that are not written in Scripture? And into the fundamental principles of what does whatever your issue is, doesn't matter what it is, it really does not matter what it is. What does the Spirit of the living God tell us? What is it that we know about God that informs how we react in a certain situation? What does the Spirit of the living God tell us about how we have treated one another? What does the Spirit of the living God tell us but to love God and to love neighbor. That is the heart of the matter. In the 80s, which seems so long ago now, in the 80s when this hymnal came out, we can't call this the new hymnal anymore, it's been out a long time, and. We're working on another one, and Lord only knows what that project's going to end up looking like. Um, there's a lot of stuff in this book that, for those of us who had lived with the 1964 hymnal, the Book of Hymns, uh, just rocked us. The communion liturgy alone was just so different. Before this hymnal, in a United Methodist Church, these words were never said regularly. Ready? The Lord be with you. A conditioned response that I'm going to tell you, being on the front lines of first trying to introduce that, it, you would have thought, you, you know, what are you doing to us, preacher? There's all those kind of things. There's a, an ecumenical version of the Lord's Prayer that I was going to make my congregation pray. And they pretty much said, no, we're not. It, it's good, I like it, but the truth is, 
trespasses and all of that, that's what I come out of, and it, it rings more true for me. But there was one thing that was new for all of us that has stuck and has a resonance that speaks to this scripture today, Jesus' instruction to his disciples to love one another. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, those primary commandments being love your neighbor and show, live that out, and to claim the truth that in Jesus' absence, a spirit has come that abides with us. And it comes, initially we looked at, what, the United Church of Canada? What is that? And why do we have their statement of faith in the United Methodist Hymnal? So then we have to learn, well, what is the United Church of Canada? Well, it's a consortium of Protestant denominations, not least of which is the Methodist Church in Canada. So, oh, then it's ours too. And it has words in it that captures not only the totality of this reading, I would argue it says more completely what our hearts most yearn to be assured is true. And I'm going to ask you to share this word with me. Open a hymnal to 883. Eight eighty three. Proclaim this statement of faith with me. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life and death in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. That is the heart of the matter. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.